Um, I'd like to introduce Matt Wilson from Rovio, the makers of Angry Birds, to talk about what's going on in his organization, having launched a number one game, followed it up with another number one game, and hopefully followed it up with another number one we game. Will. We will. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Take it away. Morning, everybody. It's good to be back in Kiev. I had a, I had a lot of fun last year. I'm sure Big Fish will be off the hook again. Uh, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm our senior manager of publishing. I run all of our publishing units, and previous to that, I ran our marketing unit from 2008 until 2011. And uh, today I'm going to go through what goes into a Rovio launch primarily with Amazing Alex and, uh, and Bad Piggies. Uh, a bit of background about, about Rovio. Um, well, three years ago, we were about 11 people, and then we were launched a, a reasonably successful bird game. And uh, we got up to about 450 people in the space of two years. Uh, we have a 70-person animation team, 180 in the game studio, and uh, a lot of people in licensing, book publishing. We're now, we changed our name about a year ago. Now we're an entertainment company. We used to be a game company. Uh, we've had about a billion downloads of Angry Birds. Well, over a billion downloads. We're playing off about 200 million monthly active users. Uh, 20 to 30 million daily active users, and we're headquartered in sunny Helsinki. So yeah, on to today's topic. Launching a number one game after launching a number one game. Uh, when I sent this title into the Casual Connect guys, we hadn't actually launched Bad Piggy, so it was a little bit presumptive, but we did okay. Um, so one of the, I'm gonna, there's a big difference between the launch of these two titles. One, Amazing Alex, uh, we launched and it was really a title we were concentrating on using our cross promotion to prove our distribution power. And then Bad Piggies was more about really giving brand recognition to the Piggies brand. So we did lots of cool strategic marketing campaigns across the world. So yeah, as an introduction to the presentation, first off, um, for Rovio, the most important thing is our fans. Fans, fans, fans first. But beyond that, we have four main cornerstones of any big marketing campaign. We set up our cross-promotion and our strategic marketing partnerships, animations, and PR blasts. The cross-promotions we do to our 20 to 30 million DAU every day in our Rovio news screen and with brand integrations into some of our apps. The strategic marketing partnerships, we, we always set the launch date of the game six months before it actually comes out so we can send out our account management and our marketing people to really engage with companies that we think we can do an awesome marketing campaign with so that we can really make it pop when the day actually comes for the launch. Uh, animation, animation is what Rovio was built on. When, uh, when we launched Angry Birds three years ago, uh, we noticed on the YouTube that most of the videos uh, of trailers, gameplay trailers for games, were just a handheld over someone's shoulder watching them play the game. And most of these videos had 1,000, 2,000 views, so we thought there was an opportunity there, and we made the original Angry Birds trailer, which subsequently that month got viewed 200,000 times on YouTube. But I think all of you have seen the results of what that brought, that gave us a brand, and I think we were the first people on mobile to actually take advantage of that. So you'll see throughout the presentation, I have a lot of animations, because we really believe that's how you build a brand. And then of course, there's PR Blast. Um, always make sure that you know the best PR people. Send out someone cool from your organization, make friends with all these big companies, because when you put out your game, you're going to want a guaranteed PR slot with whatever news agency you target. On to Amazing Alex. So Amazing Alex was our, uh, our first game after Angry Birds, our first non-Angry Birds game. Uh, Amazing Alex was an IP we picked up from a, a developer in Carlsbad near San Diego called uh, Snappy Touch. Uh, we really liked the original Casey's Contraption game. It, had, uh, it, it went straight to number one in the US App Store in 2011. And we felt it was a game that really could be brought to a much broader audience. It was a new take on an existing genre, had polished gameplay, but most importantly, it was tailor-made for touch, and every game we make has to be tailor-made for touch. No virtual joysticks. If you got a virtual joystick game, you're, you're doomed from day one, at least in our opinion. And because it also worked with point and click, it was a versatile IP. So we picked up Amazing Alex, or we picked up Casey's Contraption, 
rebranded it as Amazing Alex for a couple reasons. One, uh, we wanted to give the animation a more Rovio feel. And most importantly, uh, nobody in Finland could say Constraptions. Everybody was calling it Casey's Constrapons, which didn't go down too well. So yeah, I'm gonna move into how we launched Amazing Alex. So when we, uh, we put out the game, we, we really started blasting the PR two months before the game launched for Amazing Alex. And that was because this was the time when all the clone gate scandals were going on and we had an IP that already existed, but we wanted to make it very clear that we bought the IP, we didn't just clone it. So we sent out news stories with snippets from the original developer to really let it be known that we bought this IP, we're breathing new life into it, we're not, we're not cloning people, and we're gonna make a big blast for Amazing Alex. And we always, always aim for the biggest press sites on the planet, because when they do a review of your title, then everybody else will. We only did um, one strategic marketing partnership with Amazing Alex, and that was um, with our friends over at Steel Media, who are also behind uh, Pocket Gamer, amongst other things. They, uh, they told us they were making a new book, a new e-book, or e-magazine, and uh, we asked if they'd like to do a feature of our new game. So we shipped them over to Finland, and we gave them the whole backstory on the game, and they developed a beautiful in game or in ebook marketing campaign with us and with all of our strategic marketing partners we really try to raise value for them and for us so they raised awareness in the iOS community for amazing Alex and we uh, we I hope generated some traffic for swipe magazine so back to the trailers uh, the amazing Alex trailer we launched on the 12th of July the day of the, the game launch and the point with this trailer was we really wanted to give the IP character. We're in the, we're in the business of building brands. We don't put out a game as a one-off. So we tried to give Alex a real life. And uh, in the story, amazing Alex uses his, uh, he's imagining he's playing a game of baseball. So he has to build a contraption so that he gets the ball pitched to him. So he can pretend he's hitting a home run in the ninth inning. Have a, have a quick look at the trailer. The game is all tied up. It's top of the ninth. Two outs with runners on first and second. This right here is what we call a make-or-break moment, baseball fans. We've got some action on the mound. Ball one to high and inside. Douglas walked in the fifth after taking a full count. I think he's just looking for something he can take a swing at. Here's the lineup. So what we, uh, what we do with all of our launches, we, uh, we have the 20 to 30 million people we can promote all of our launches to. So we put cross-promotion into all of our games. And, uh, and when we do this cross-promotion, we, we really we put out updates to all of our titles, do the brand integrations into the games, so that when you're playing Angry Birds Space, you immediately will see uh, the amazing Alex button there to tempt you. Do, would you like to try this game? This is another game from Rovio. And we have a, our cross-promotion through a bunch of our different titles. So yeah, also in all of our Angry Birds Classic games, we, we put the Amazing Alex trailers, in, our Amazing Alex uh, upsell button into them. Drives a huge amount of traffic to our new games and uh, really helps bring brand recognition to uh, Amazing Alex. Uh, Rovio's marketing channels have uh, kind of become a machine over the last few years. We've, uh, we've got up to 700 million YouTube channel views and a lot of important big media companies actually subscribe to our YouTube channel. So when we put out a video, it'll get picked up by pretty much all the, the big media sites. 
Also, when we launched the game, we uh, sent it out to our 22 million Facebook fans and our 500 plus uh, Twitter followers. And uh, the results of that were pretty phenomenal. Uh, for uh, also our in games on Android, they're uh, they're mostly ad based, and they prove as a very strong cross promotion platform. And I believe that anybody that has a paid app on iOS should bring it across as a uh, as a free app on Android with advertising, because one, the advertisers will pay you more money than the downloads you'll get from being a paid app, and two, you want visibility, you want to be able to promote your next product, and this gives you a huge chance to do it. And uh, we try to make cool, rich media ad campaigns inside our Android titles so that we can, so we can really give someone a cool experience with the advertising. Like uh, the image in the top right, there's a pig in the corner, and if you drag the pig down with your finger, it unwraps the screen and shows you uh, an amazing Alex uh, preview image. So yeah, in, uh, in conclusion, uh, Amazing Alex was uh, a great way for us to test our distribution power and if we do start becoming a, a publisher, we know that whatever we can put out, we can really brute force to the top of the market. Uh, in general, for Amazing Alex, the brand recognition wasn't quite as strong with, all the str with, the, with the lack of strategic marketing campaigns, but we managed to push the game to the top. Great cross-promotion and we're very happy with how it went. Uh, now I'm going to move on to our uh, little bit bigger title, the, the Bad Piggies. So Bad Piggies uh, was, was our first game from the pig's perspective. We, uh, we always felt the pigs were undervalued in the Angry Birds franchise and they really needed their own breath of life. Uh, also it was our first Unity title so we got to experiment with a different engine and different capabilities in our title. Uh, for, for Bad Piggies, when we launched it, we really had the goal of building a big social media following for Bad Piggies, really raise brand awareness so that when we put out our next title, or when we put out the Bad Piggies title, we could blast it on Facebook and get a lot of users fast. So let's have a quick look at how we uh, did our PR marketing to get to tease the uh, Bad Piggies game. We, uh, we launched the Something Pig is Coming campaign. And uh, in the Something Pig is Coming campaign, we didn't want to tell anybody what the game was actually going to be about. Everybody thought the pigs were going to be in slingshots being fired at the birds. And we wanted to let them think that. So we just let, we put out teaser images for weeks and weeks just trying to build our Facebook channel. Uh, it all kicked off with this press release from the uh, King Pig. Uh, he says, uh, today, Piggy Island, we has Facebook and Twitter. You know like? We as new, gotta go, more later. Okay, thanks, bye. It doesn't make any sense, but neither do the pigs. And uh, we continued on these teaser campaigns, sending out images every day. We set up a badpiggies.com where all the pigs were behind a screen uh, watching, uh, watching a television reel of the Wright brothers making a plane and in Detroit, them building cars and just all these silly teaser campaigns where the pigs were learning how to build things, trying to let our fans guess what the game was going to be about. They still thought it was going to be a slingshot game, but that's okay. But our, uh, our PR campaign turned into a, a big success because then we uh, launched this video. <laughs> so yeah, the uh, the teaser campaign worked beautifully. We got um we got up to 200,000 Bad Piggies followers on the Bad Piggies fan page in less than two weeks. So when we launched the title, we actually had a, a, a very big following to actually push the game out to, which gives us a huge advantage over pretty much everyone. All right, launch day, cinematic trailer time. Ha <laughs> ha! 
launch day, we, we take our launch days pretty serious in Helsinki. Uh, we were going green big time with this campaign. So everybody in the office wore green. We changed all the light bulbs green. We have a store in our office with all the Bad Piggies merchandise, all the Angry Birds merchandise. All the birds had to wear pig masks for that day. Everybody went green. You had to put a pig in the back of your car. We take it seriously. So when we, uh, when we launched the, the trailer, and it's a nice trailer, trust me, it got viewed two million times, I think. We, uh, we struck a deal with Yahoo.com, which is still the third most viewed website online, just behind Google and Facebook. And they featured the video on their homepage. And uh, the video, I believe, was the second most viral video of all of October. And, uh, well, well, the last month, and it made, it made for a pretty good launch story for Rovio. Here's the trailer. So yeah, we uh, also, we did a bunch of, uh, we always think globally, and we did big launch events in lots of different territories. Uh, a good example to start off with in, uh, in Taiwan, in the, uh, there's a, a retailer, a telecom retailer called Far East Tone, and Far East Tone have 100 to 200 stores in Taiwan, and we rebranded every single one of their stores with, amaz uh, with bad piggies, gave away 10,000 helium balloons, we had the Angry Birds Asian babes there giving out balloons to all the people. And uh, we had a press release on the top of the 101 second biggest building in the world in Taipei with the uh, mayor of Taipei. And uh, he agreed that we could light up the building for one day. So the whole of Taipei got to see the, the Bad Piggies building shining across the skyline, which, uh, which was great for building our brand recognition in, uh, in Taiwan, uh, Rovio and Angry Birds is, is massive in Asia, so we really put a lot of effort into cultivating our Asian fans. Also, we uh, continued it on in Shanghai. In Shanghai, we did a, a very big launch event with China Mobile for, uh, for their uh, channel. Uh, we had a big China Mobile party, and also China Mobile agreed to demo all of the Angry Birds trailers on the side of the Citibank building, which is the largest television in the world. And uh, we had big green lights lighting up the whole of downtown Shanghai for the day. On top of that, we had a, a green truck and a red truck racing after each other throughout the city all day, giving away merchandise to all of our fans, playing Angry Birds music. In, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, we did a similar campaign with Nissan. They were really pushing the Nissan Leaf there. So they took a, a lot of leaves, I actually don't know how many, and decorated them all with Angry Birds merchandise or Bad Piggies merchandise and race them around the city, giving things to the fans, trying to find new people who had, didn't know the game and trying to reach out to new users. 
Then in London, we, uh, we set up uh, an interesting campaign there because back in 1977, Pink Floyd released an album called Animals. And uh, on the cover of their album, they had a big, giant, floating pig on top of Battersea Station. So we were like, well, that was 30 years ago. Most of our fans probably don't remember that. So let, let's do it again. So we put a big green pig floating on top of Battersea Station, which is right on the, on the Thames in London, lit it up with green lights, put the bad piggies imagery all across it, and you could see it all across the, the, southern, the southwest waterfront of London. Just another big, ridiculous marketing stunt, but it was fun. So, uh, in conclusion, we have a few other last, uh, the last more, some are pretty notable, but uh, I don't have imagery for campaigns that we pulled off on launch day. Uh, Barnes & Noble in the U.S., which has 700 plus stores, we, we put the uh, Bad Piggies uh, gameplay trailer playing across all of the televisions and all of the stores. We, uh, we also, in Korea, we were on the cover of Yahoo.com. We got featured by Amazon, we got featured by Apple, and then of course, traditionally, we, we had to do a big cross-promotion push where we had a pop-up as soon as you launched Angry Birds, prompting you that a Bad Piggies was alive, and also put it in our Rovio news channel where we serve some 200 million impressions a day to uh, promote the Bad Piggies game. Yeah, so, Bad Piggies versus Amazing Alex. Bad Piggies, we actually did a lot of traditional marketing, and we did it for Bad Piggies because we were really trying to establish that brand, really give it brand equity. And we feel that these big stunts that get covered in the news and are, are something tangible that people can actually see and feel raise the value of our brand, help us sell our physical goods, help us sell our games. So with Bad Piggies, unlike Amazing Alex, we really did... We really felt that traditional marketing gave us a big step up on everyone else to, to build our brand. Uh, and most importantly, and always the most important thing at Rovio, is our fans love the game. And uh, without a polished product, no amount of marketing and word of mouth will keep the game in the charts. If, it doesn't, uh, if, it's, a, if it's a crap game, it doesn't matter how good your marketing campaign is, it, it, it won't work. So yeah, Rovio is all about the fans, and everything we do is for our fans. And uh, we think the uh, Confucius of our day, the legendary fake Grimlock, said it best when he said, uh, the best marketing is be awesome. Best marketeer is user you are awesome for. Uh, and I don't know if any of you know Grimlock, but essentially what he's saying is make an awesome product for your awesome fans. And if you don't have an awesome product, then you know, the fans won't take to it, regardless of how much marketing you do. So we do all these crazy stunts to build this brand recognition, but in the end of the day, we still answer every email, every tweet, try to answer as much of the uh, Facebook conversation about Angry Birds as possible. We have a social media team that are speaking multiple languages. It's essential for us to not only you know, make sure that our users understand the games uh, like the games, that we can take their feedback back in and, and make things better. You know, you have to talk to your fans. I mean, when I launched Angry Birds three years ago, I was PR marketing, but on top of that, I answered every fan email, and Peter Vesterbacka answered every tweet. 
and there was a lot of tweets. Here, here's a nice little example of a, a conversation between one of our fans and, uh, and the bad piggies. I think the bad piggy might have been flirting with this girl. He looks a little bit demure, a little bit cheeky there. But we like to, we like to really engage with every one of our fans. And every now and then, you know, there's, there's things in our games that have come from our fans. Uh, uh, like we had an email when we were making Angry Birds from a little kid in, in Texas who drew a level, and then we actually put the level in the game. And we wrote his name in the sky. We really care about our fans. Fans first. Remember that. So now I'm going to go on a bit of a rant about uh, user acquisition. And there's no more videos, so I can't, I can't mess it up anymore. So I was, uh, I was looking at the charts yesterday. And, uh, well, 11 of the top 20 are very clearly heavily user acquisition funded, CPI funded. And uh, as someone that tried to excel in marketing over the last few years, this, this frustrated me because these guys, they aren't doing any marketing. They're doing advertising and they're taking all the limelight away from all the companies that are really working hard on marketing. Actually, I don't think anybody's really working hard on marketing except for us. But. And, uh, and this, this it kind of, I was at Gamescom and I got really aggravated when I started looking at these charts. Like this is... This is not right. These guys are not doing real promotion. This is not like console. And then I was listening to a panel, and uh, one of the heavily VC-backed companies in, uh, I'm not going to say where they're from, but anyways, their CMO made this statement. We put out our game, didn't send out a press release or get reviewed by any blogs, but the game just took off virally. It just took off. They put the game in the App Store, and it was massive the next day. Thankfully, someone else in the crowd was a little bit peeved as well and was like, how much money did you spend? She didn't answer, but I was stewing for a little bit that night, and then I uh, went out with a friend of mine who is much wiser than I, and he pointed out that actually companies that are spending a lot of money on CPI should actually be my true love. Well, they're true, my, my true love for a couple of reasons. A lot of people buy our ad inventory, which is great. But the other reason is, essentially, all these uh, VC-backed, CPI-funded games have changed the market. All you see in Pocket Game or all you see in TechCrunch is people moaning about user acquisition costs. The only way to get into the market is if we spend a lot of money on user acquisition. And they've essentially created this mindset that in the mobile industry, the only way you can chart is if you buy users. And, uh, and for us, and for the Disneys of the world that actually do real marketing, this is great. They've left the door wide open. Nobody's doing any marketing. So now, now when we put out a cool marketing stunt, it gets covered by everyone because all the big players in our market are just spending all their money on user acquisition, building no brand equity. So what, I, what I'm trying to say is when you do these marketing campaigns, it's more than just reaching out to your, to, it's more than, than just to get your game up the charts. It's actually to make someone feel something about your game. I put this example in here is like, you know, we, these are our IAPs, or maybe these are our OAPs. And I don't mean old age pensioners, I mean outside of app purchases. And we wouldn't be able to do this if we didn't do these big marketing campaigns, these big trailers to supplement all the marketing that we do. We're really building a brand, and if you're just buying users, you're not building a brand. I have not seen a Rage of Bahamut toy anywhere. It might be there, but I haven't seen it yet. And what it comes down to is when we do these ridiculous stunts, put an angry bird attached to the Space Needle in Seattle, this, this image got tweeted, I think, something like 10 million times. That builds real brand equity. When you do this kind of ad campaign, and this is a real ad campaign that was being run in Angry Birds for a while. I have to admit I clicked on it. I wanted to know what the uh, secret game was. I don't know if any of you would tweet this or share this image with your friends. But I bet you, well, maybe a few of you would be interested in finding out what the secret game is. But essentially, that's not marketing. That's tricking someone into uh, downloading your game. And, well, the old Z company made a lot of money back in the day tricking people with these kind of ads. So my point is really, do something cool. You can build a brand that way. 
if you're just going to do buying installs, it's, it's never going to really give you any equity in your brand. But it could be a cool secret game. So yeah, I, I feel like there's a massive window of opportunity for all of us right now to do a really cool marketing campaign. None of the big companies with big pockets are in your way. They're all spending all their money on advertising because their VCs want to know exactly how their marketing budget's being spent. And I'm sure that the games press, the pocket gamers, touch arcades, whoever else of the world would love a good story about a game developer. Let's say you're making the next parachuting game. Get your whole team, jump out of a plane and make a reality trailer of that game. And I bet you, I bet you the press will pick it up. The window's open. Take the chance. Nobody's doing any marketing. And no marketing stunt is too stupid. I mean, I don't know if any of you guys saw the Resident Evil marketing for Resident Evil 6 with the, uh, with the butchers, with all the uh, zombies' penises. I mean, it went viral, but it was, was kind of gross. Um, yeah, so in a sense, the gaming media wants something cool to write about. Give it to them. Do a cool marketing campaign. I pulled this, uh, I think this is one of my favorite marketing stories of the last few years. This is, uh, it's not in games, but I think it's still kind of relevant. This is uh, a company called Clean Bottle, and they build these bottles for bikes that you can unscrew on both sides so they're easier to clean. And they had an online portal, and the guy really felt he had some special product and he didn't have much money to market it. So what did he do? He went down to the local costume place, got someone to design this bottle boy costume, booked a flight to France, rented a car, and followed around the Tour de France for three weeks. He would jump out of the car in front of the pack, run with the front of the pack, get covered on ESPN, get covered on all the big TV stations, and over, over the three weeks or two weeks of the Tour de France, he had something like 20 minutes of airtime. And also, he sold $2 million worth of revenue of his clean bottles from his web portal, which are now everywhere in the US. Simple guerrilla marketing. If this one guy can do it, surely your armies of people can do it. Yeah, just to, to kind of finalize this, um, I, another, another little rant I have is all the developers I know, they push out a game and they try to go for the US. And then they end up in 500 in the US. Well, I don't understand why nobody liked my game. Whereas I, I personally believe that it'd be much better to be a big fish in lots of small ponds than to be that 500th in the US. And the example here is, I couldn't find the Ukrainian numbers, but in Russia, to go number one two days ago, took 900 paid downloads. If you can't get number one in Russia for 900 paid downloads, and you're not working very hard. Send your whole team to the biggest mall in Moscow and hand out flyers, you'll be number one. So get, get big in all these small territories. The graph is showing the economies of scale. If you're outside the top 10, you're not making any money. So get top 10 in a lot of small territories. And then you will make income over time. And if you're lucky and you can prove that you can stick in the top 10 in a lot of those different territories, you've got proof of concept. Go to Apple, you might get featured, and then, hey, you won't be 500 in the US anymore. So to wrap this up, um, start showing off your product early. Don't finish the game and launch it the next day. Try to build a real marketing campaign. No marketing ideas are too crazy. And uh, you only get, well, you focus on getting things right the first time. Make the game right. Don't put out the game with a big bug in it. People will only play it once and then they won't give you another chance. And whatever you do, make sure you make your launch pop. Do something crazy. Get your name out there. And uh, I'm Matthew Wilson, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. We have time for some questions. I've got questions and I've got a bag full of bribes for who asked the questions. <laughs> All right, well, I'll start with a question. No. Uh, first, of, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, we have two questions, and one of it's a bit tricky. If you feel like not answering it, it's okay. 
Okay. Uh, I will be talking about offline campaigns. Uh, how do you measure your effectiveness of offline campaigns, and uh, how do you measure it in line with web campaigns? Do you switch off web, or you continue, and how do you separate them? To be honest, it's it's almost impossible to track an offline campaign. Uh, we do insight tests where we'll do surveys of, let's say it was Taiwan, we'll do a survey of 20,000 Taiwanese people through our channels, and we'll get that data back to, to kind of evaluate whether there was any value in the marketing campaign we did. But for pure numbers, it's impossible. Okay. And then with web campaigns, we do have a lot of analytics built into even our tweets, social media, Facebook posts, so we do have metrics on how successful any given post was. So mainly you calculate web and then extract it from overall? No, uh, we, uh, we don't really look at it that way. We don't, we don't have a, anybody that we have to explain ourselves to, so we just try to aim for a really cool marketing stunt, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, and the second question is about budgeting. How do you think uh, offline campaigns must be budgeted? Uh, I mean, in what proportions, proportions from uh, overall marketing and uh, budgeting? We, uh, we don't really spend much money on these offline campaigns. That's why we, we work with partners. We, we can bring traffic to whatever their products may be, so we try to partner with uh, companies that can give us a lot of exposure in whatever given territory. So realistically, we, our marketing spend is the wages we pay our, our employees. And about the uh, buildings, the cars, how do you think this might be? Strategic marketing partnerships. That's, that's the strategy. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And do you want a pig? <laughs> Hi. I have a question. Most of the companies that are present here, they are like small companies, and some of them thinking if they should go and market on their own or go to some publishers. So, and for them, like money and big strategic partnership are not the case. If you had a startup right now and a game, and you think it's a go cool game, um, and you have ten thousand dollars budget, it's what about most of these guys have? Uh, how would you spend it? How would I spend it? Uh, honestly, this is my opinion, not Rovio's. What I would do is I would, I'm sure that most of these game companies or most of these small companies know bigger companies or have a friend's company that's had moderate success. And I would actually, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen TinyCo's new Tiny Partners program where they will give a percentage of the revenue from their game to the developer that uh, promotes their game. So let's say like Fluke Entertainment, are, they have the Tiny Co. eggs in their game. And for every single user that Fluke send to Tiny Co.'s Tiny Monsters, they keep 50% of the revenue lifetime of that user. So I would go and talk with my friends, and I would agree these sort of deals where you give away part of your revenue in exchange for visibility. That's what I would do. And you want a bird. Fine now? Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for uh, for your speech. Everything's fine? Okay, thanks for your speech. You said that uh, Rovio is quite big at China. Uh, did you felt that any exotic localizations uh, did really give some big revenue to you? Or that was just for uh, getting in touch with your users at, at the markets where English uh, language can be quite uh, unusual? Mm. I'm not sure if I understand. Uh, are you talking about localization to content in the game? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, did you felt, did you feel that localizations were were useful to you? Did they uh, bring uh, some revenue, or it was just for uh, getting in touch with your users? I I, uh, I think Rovio is the wrong company to ask about localization because in Angry Birds, I think there's a total of four or five words. Actually. So <laughs> I don't. Uh, we 
we localize our app store descriptions, and uh, beyond that, we don't do any localization. And that's, and that's because when we build a game, if you check out Bad Piggies or Amazing Alex, there's almost no text in any of our games. And uh, even in China, do you do any, um, any promo localizations for that on, on that markets that don't really use English language at all? Well, we have, a, we have a Chinese office, and they do a lot of PR stunts in China and talk to the media, and we do have the game out on China Mobile's uh, carrier and with game descriptions, but as far as in-game localization, mm -hmm. we don't do any. We do do marketing localization. We have Chinese social media people that you know, interact on, I think it's called Weibo and the Chinese social networks. Okay, thanks, Will. Bird or a pig? It's an important question. Hello. Uh, I have a small question. Uh, what kind of genres of games you are looking for to publish? Um, we're looking for for very casual games that appeal to anybody. Our, our user demographic is 51, 49%. Uh, so we want a game that appeal to male, female, young and old, touch mechanics. Um, it can be paid, it can be freemium. We're not, we're not precious there, but uh, it has to be something most importantly. I think uh, Andrew Stalbo said it best, it has to have two eyes. You can make a plush toy out of it, then we're interested. Does that make sense? If you can make if you can make a physical good out of it, that's that's when we're most interested because we're we're in the business of building brands, and if it's uh, a text-based game, there's nothing that we can do with it beyond gaming. And uh, we've kind of we're trying to place ourselves as an entertainment company, so everything we do needs to be animation friendly. It needs to be physical good friendly, book friendly, everything. Bird or pig? Bird? There we go. Uh, okay, I have, a, uh, I have a question. Uh, now you're talking about the, um, games after the original Birdstone was, la uh, <laughs> sorry, Angry Birds was launched. And um, how much effort you spent and how much time and how much money you spent and uh, what kind of marketing uh, you did for the original title, for the original Angry Birds? Well, I, I personally was PR marketing when we launched the original Angry Birds, and our company was verging on bankruptcy. So the amount of money I spent was my time and my really bad pay. But we had a lot of motivation. The company would have gone under if I hadn't busted my ass. So I, I, I tried to do creative things. I noticed there was little trends, like if I, uh, if I got reviewed on the only Danish language iPhone website, the game would go top 10 in the charts. And then I noticed, okay, there's only in Greece two different iPhone websites that are in Greek. That's where the Greek people get their information from. They were both reviewed Angry Birds on the same day, top 10. And I followed this strategy a bunch, around a bunch of small territories, and we, we went up the charts, and we never dropped in any of these places. So we kind of were building a proof of concept that we can get this game charted in a lot of territories. It stays there. Chilingo, go to Apple and get us featured. But we had a publisher as well. Two. I've only, uh, no, I've got one bird left. All right, for a while. I don't want to take them home, so. <laughs> one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, we all understand that it's very hard to repeat the success of Angry Birds. Uh, but uh, can you give some numbers uh, on how the numbers of downloads of Amazing Alex and Bad Piggies is lower than Angry Birds? 
I can't give you those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, amazing Alex, we're happy with what it uh, what achieved. I mean, if you compare anything to Angry Birds, then all we're going to do forever is fail. Um, Bad Piggies has been a pretty phenomenal success on iOS. And, uh, you know, it's keeping our fans warmed up for Star Wars, which is going to blow everyone away. Okay, thank bird, you. Bird or a pig? Pig. There's only one bird left. I have a question. Hi, Matthew. Um, you are senior manager of publishing, and uh, actually, I'm uh, only from the half of the speech. So um, maybe you have told about this, but have you uh, already signed some games for publishing? Except Amazing Alex, who's like your half partly company. Let's just say we're exploring. There'll be some developments in 2012. We're looking. I'm looking. So if you have a game, find me. How do you... Go ahead. <laughs> Didn't even try. How do you organize the process of prolonging game life cycle? Uh, for example, for Amazing Alex, did you plan earlier? What will you do? Um, because, you know, simply the, the life cycle is relatively short. For Angry Birds, it's like evergreen. So how do you see the process of prolonging the life cycle of the game? Well, I mean, we generally treat our games as a service, and we always plan to put out an update every four to six weeks for any title. And uh, we've been trying to do that with Alex. It hasn't hasn't had the same effect as Angry Birds, but we, uh, before we launched the game, we already had updates ready. And that's how we try to prolong the life cycle. Push the update out, get re-engaged in the title. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's basically what we do. <coughs> I'm going hoarse. Well, uh, do you plan any special marketing activities for uh, launching of uh, Angry Birds Star Wars? <laughs> yes, and I can't tell you about them, but they're going to be massive. <laughs> it's going to be a very, very big launch. Uh, I really, I can't tell you though. <laughs> Lucas would shoot me. Oh, you're going to ask the same question? Okay, well, we have one over here. Uh, hello, Matthew. Thank you for a great speech. Uh, so I wanted to ask um, um, about your marketing activities. Your... Um, uh, are you doing any campaigns uh, after the launch of the game, so to to roast it and uh, and to hold the positions? Yeah, um, I guess the best example of that would be Angry Birds Seasons, where we do the seasonal campaigns all the time. Um, like we uh, last year was the year of the dragon in China, and uh, we went over there and we made a, a mooncake festival update. And we put in the mighty eagle became a dragon for one month in that in that level pack. So I, I think Angry Bird Season is a good example of how we try to breathe new life into our titles. And we did a big back to school campaign in the summer with uh, with Toys R Us as well. We uh, if we have a, a really big update coming out, we try to do something cool. Um, Halloween update probably is might even be available now, and you know, we're pushing that out alongside of all of our costumes with our partners, so we keep trying. Uh, hello. Someone's talking. Oh, there you are. Well, I, actually, I wasn't talking. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was waiting till you throw it. Okay. So go ahead, over there, in front. You, go yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question about Facebook. Uh, how do you look at it? And if you are going to, if you are uh, planning to port another games or Angry Birds was just kind of test or something? Um, I don't actually know what our plans are for our other games. Um, Facebook, <laughs> it's 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 valuable to us. I think we're we're tracking in at maybe two or three million DAU there, but um, it's not where our strength comes from. Our strength comes from mobile and our, our advertising on mobile and cross promotion. And uh, because of that, Facebook is not our main focus. 
But I think we have a pretty engaged audience on Facebook. It's the top rated game. It's not the top monetizing game, but um, I mean, I, I, I still see a future for Facebook, for Facebook gaming. I don't know whether our titles are perfectly suited for Facebook. I think that's, that's kind of where we sit right now. And a burger or a pig. I've only got two left, so two more questions. OK. Uh Hi. Uh, quick question. You, you were mentioning the fact that you want a new IPs to be uh, a plush toys as well as games, as well as maybe, I don't know, cartoons. But as a publisher, what, what, how does it work with IP ownership? Do you want to own the IP or do you share the IP with the developer or what, what's the plan? It's all case by case. Uh, it depends on the IP. I, I, I couldn't give you that answer here. You can track me down later. So I think we have time for two more questions, yeah. and I have the two questions right here. So, hi, Matt. I have one question for you. Uh, please tell: uh, Can Rovio calculate how uh, cost uh, one uh, install or playing uh, user from offline company? Um, Is it possible for Rovio? How much people are paying for an install? Uh, how many? How much uh, cost one uh, user? who install, uh, for example, PIX uh, from offline companies, from, from not uh, uh, your cross-promotion companies? From, from the, yeah, I think that was kind of asked earlier. We, we can't track how much that costs. But I would imagine for us it doesn't cost a huge amount because, uh, well, we're pretty good at generating a lot of press. But I, I couldn't quantify it for you. Sorry. And the, my last two birds are already given away. Right here. Um, I also want to begin. So here is a question. What do you prefer, chicken or pork? I, I personally, I'm from the pork side. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's quite funny. I, uh, I go to events and I normally keep bird and pig cards on me. And ironically, men always take birds, women, and, uh, and women always take pigs. So I mean, Women love pigs. That's why. That's that's why. Uh, that's why men do okay in this world. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're done. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Everyone.